Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first virtual edition of the LED 212 user meeting. My name is Roy Copping. I've been asked to moderate the session this year. It's my pleasure to do that. Uh, I thank you all, all of you for I thank you all thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. I think we have a very good program available to us in the short time uh, we have this morning. And my slides on. I think we have a very good program uh, this morning. Following a, a brief introduction of myself, we have uh, we have four speakers currently engaged in LED 212 uh, research. I want to thank all of those speakers in advance for, for joining us this morning. They'll all be giving short presentations. Following me, we have uh, we have Meng Shi Lee from Viewpoint. We also have Sangeeta Ray from Johns Hopkins University, Ibrahim Dalabasan from Radio Medics. And finally, Matt O'Hara from Pacific Northwest uh, National Laboratory. Following the talks, you'll have a, a moderated uh, question and answer segment. And I ask that anybody who has any questions to please direct those questions through the, through the Q&A app feature uh, available uh, on this Zoom call. Uh, those questions will be collected and we'll run through those following the, the, the talks uh, this morning. So I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I just want to give a brief introduction before I get into Radium LED 212 generators that we manufactured Oak Ridge. But for those that don't know, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has a very rich history uh, of radioisotope production, uh, that have, production of radioisotopes that have uh, applications in nuclear medicine. This all started back in the, in the 1940s, uh, following the Manhattan Project. The lab had available to it the, the Oak Ridge graphite reactor, also had the calutron machines that had previously been used to, to enrich the actinides. Some of these work for these machines was directed to now produce stable isotopes. The stable isotopes uh, could be irradiated in the graphite reactor to produce a variety of uh, radioisotopes with nuclear medicine applications. The first shipment of a medical radioisotope was made by the lab to a hospital in 1946. This was a shipment of carbon-14. It was followed up in the next 20 years with a variety of other isotopes uh, and over thousands of shipments. Also in the 1940s, the lab established a large-scale mouse genetics project to study the effects of radiation on mammals. That ran up until about 2009. In the 1990s, the, the lab continued to develop a variety of radioisotopes with uh, important nuclear medicine pro properties. In 1993, the production of the tungsten 188, rhenium 188 generator uh, was established. Later in the 1990s, the production of actinium-225, an important, as you all know, an important targeted alpha therapeutic uh, uh, isotope used in nuclear medicine uh, was established. Also in the 1990s, the, the low-dose radiation research program ran uh, up until about 2011. And then more recently, uh, of note, uh, the lab has established production of, of actinium-227 and now has a, a, a production contract with Bayer Pharmaceutical to produce actinium-227, which is the parent isotope of radium-223, which is used in the Bayer drugs of FIGO, uh, used to treat metastasized prostate cancer. What I want to talk about this morning is the radium lead 212 generator production. Uh, I'm the group leader for the nuclear and radiochemistry group uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, we're responsible for the production of the radium lead 212 generator at Oak Ridge. Uh, I don't want to uh, preach to the choir here this morning, but as all of you are aware, radium 224 is a short lead uh, isotope, uh, decays to, to lead 212. The parent of radium 224 is thorium 228, which itself can be derived from a longer lived parent, uh, uranium 232. And in my group, we've uh, we established production uh, back in uh, 2014. Uh, the radium-224 can be separated from a thorium-228 cow, loaded onto a generator. Uh, this generator can then be periodically milked for lead and or bismuth-212. In my group, we've been supplying generators up to about 16 millicuries uh, of activity of radium, typically making shipments uh, every three weeks. Uh, to maximize the amount of uh, radium that we have available in the generators, we supplement our thorium-228 cow from a, from a stock of uranium-232 that we have roughly on, a, on an annual basis. For those of you that don't know me, I can't get through a talk without showing any separations chemistry, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly. This is a photograph that I know many of you have seen uh, of our glove box uh, where we store thorium-228 and make the radium lead 212 generators. As I just alluded to, we have a stock of uranium-232 that we periodically supplement 228 cow from on roughly an annual basis. We use two anion exchangers to separate the thorium uh, and recover the uranium uh, as, a, as a continuing supply for the thorium-228. The generators themselves are manufactured following some additional separations chemistry. 
We'll take the thorium-228 cow that we store following separation from uranium-232. This cow is allowed to equilibrate with its daughters, including the radium-224. And then roughly on a three-weekly basis, we'll take the thorium cow when it's ready, ready to prepare a generator. We separate the thorium uh, on an anion exchange column. Uh, the radium passes straight through this column. Uh, the thorium can later be recovered uh, for further use in generator production. The radium itself with the lead 212 is still associated with it at this point can be cleaned up on a further cation column. We load the radium on the column and then we use an HCL strip to separate the lead 212. Uh, this is important and allows us to minimize the dose that's actually in the package uh, that we ship out uh, to customers. Following removal of the lead, the radium is separated from the column uh, in eight more nitric prior to manufacturing the generator. This is a photograph of the generator itself. It's uh, basically a five centimeter long piece of, uh, of Teflon tubing containing about a quarter milliliter bed volume of uh, cation exchange resin. It's loaded, the radium is loaded onto the generator in dilute nitric acid, milked once more with, uh, uh, eluted once more with lead 212 to minimize the dose further before we package it uh, for shipment. We've done some work at Oak Ridge just to assess the, assess the elution profile of lead 212 from the generator itself. As I mentioned, the bed volume of this is about a quarter of a milliliter. The lead 212 uh, can be periodically milked from the generator with about one milliliter uh, of, of two molar uh, HCL. This is a photograph of the, the generator itself packaged up in about an inch and a quarter lead pig ready for shipment to customers. This is just a photograph of a sim simple uh, setup of how the generator can be uh, set up and eluded for lead 212 uh, by the customers. Uh, a couple of points on the future developments of radium lead 212 generators at Oak Ridge. We have an extended available supply of thorium 238 now that we anticipate using to, to, uh, for all radium lead 212 generator production, which will allow us to load higher activities on the generators. We expect to expand production in FY20 stroke FY21. One additional point to note of late would be in adding a glove box shield to our glove box that will further minimize worker dose, which will ultimately allow us to load more radium air onto our generators. So we'll be able to supply higher activity generators. And I'll just mention that we can continue to work with customers uh, on schedules for the generators and the activities that can be loaded. And I don't want to take up any more time. So that, that, that's me finished. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, screen and pass on to Meng Shi. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone to get online. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the, the, uh, our um, work in the combination of lead to 12 alpha particle therapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction about the melanoma disease and um, uh, the immunotherapies and the rationale for combining the radiation and uh, uh, immunotherapies. And then I'm going to introduce uh, our approach to deliver lead to 12 to melanoma and also the, uh, the uh, synergistic anti-tumor effect from this combination, including the single dose and versus fraction dose. And then I will talk about uh, the mechanism study where we used uh, the genetic, um, um, genetically modified animal model and also the vaccination tumor re-challenging study. So just to keep, to keep everyone on the same page, uh, melanoma is the most aggressive skin cancer with about uh, 96,000 diagnoses and about 7,000 deaths in the United States this year. And uh, early stage of melanoma is largely curable by surgical removal, um, but the late stage is always lethal. Uh, with a recent breakthrough in target therapy and immunotherapies. The five-year five year survival rate uh, was improved to uh, 25%. So immunocheckpoint inhibitors are antibodies that bind and inhibit the uh, immunosuppressive machineries like CTLA4 and PD-1, PD-L1 signaling pathway in lymph nodes and tumor microenvironments. So they reactivate the uh, immune system and, and induce anti-tumor immunity. So as you can see here, compare with the uh, conventional chemotherapy, which didn't really do anything um, in these patients, the improvement has been striking. The uh, overall response rate, um, we got like about 19% uh, to 58% with a complete response rate from 6% to 22%. Uh, and the rationale for um, combining radiation and immunotherapy um, is that the radiation-induced immunogenic cell death. So when tumor cells are killed by um, radiation, they release tumor-associated antigens that uh, activate the uh, T cells. The, uh, the activated effector T cells will uh, 
for example, the cytotoxic T cell will migrate and infiltrate the distal tumors. So years of effort has led, led to hundreds of uh, clinic trials um, for, uh, to test the quote unquote abscopal effect where you hit one tumor with radiation and rely on the, uh, the hoping that it will activate the uh, immune response and to attack the distal tumor. However, the general um, response was just suboptimal and only regional tumor control was achieved. So this recent Nature Review paper really advocates for um, irradiating, irradiating all tumor sites where you create more hot tumor and enhance the uh, quantity and diversity of tumor associated antigens. So the approach we use to systemically deliver uh, led to 12 uh, is a uh, cyclized um, peptide that specific binds with MC1R receptor on the melanoma cell surface. Um, as you can see here in this biodistribution uh, study using the LAT203 surrogates, the LAT labeled peptide uh, accumulates in B16 melanoma tumor and gets cleared through kidney and urine. And this accumulation is mediated by binding with the receptor that can be um, completely blocked by excess amount of uh, uh, unlabeled peptide injection. So using this approach, we tested the uh, synergistic anti-tumor effect um, for the combination of LAT212 and immunotherapy. And for the LAT212 group, we did a single dose of uh, 100 microcurie injection. And uh, for the immunotherapy, we did, uh, we did both anti-PD-1 and type CTLA-4 uh, every two, uh, twice, uh, twice a week. And for the combination group, we started both therapy uh, concurrently from the day zero. And we found that this is a pretty aggressive tumor and uh, actually uh, the control animals uh, were euthanized shortly after a week. And on the other hand, the, uh, the single injection of led to 12 therapy significantly slowed down the tumor, uh, tumor growth. The most interesting finding was that uh, with the combination of led to 12 and immunotherapy uh, significantly uh, improved the uh, response and uh, there are actually 43% of the animal had a complete tumor remission from the established tumor. Actually, we took these animals and left them for a week drug holiday and before re challenged them with uh, uh, 50,000 uh, naive B16 uh, cells. And we found that those animals after therapy, those animals gained long-term anti-tumor uh, immunity, actually except for one animal that uh, slowly developed tumor after three weeks, all the other animals stay tumor free for extra uh, two months after the re-challenge. So we moved on and tested the, um, the combination therapy using fractionated led to 12 doses uh, with three fractions over, uh, over a period of one week. And we found pretty, pretty similar synergistic effects. However, the, the overall efficacy was largely compromised, uh, indicating that the, the dosing strategy and timing of uh, LAT212 is critical for this combination. And also, we applied this combination therapy in this genetically modified animal model, RAC1 uh, RAC knockout mice. These mice were originated from C57 black mice. Uh, but because of the uh, genetic mutation, they only have innate immunity like NK cell and macrophages, but they don't have uh, uh, adaptive immunity like B cell or T cell. Not surprisingly, there was no benefit from the combination at all compared with the, just the monotherapy of led to 12, indicating that the adaptive immunity is very necessary for this, um, uh, for this combination uh, therapy. And the other experiment we did was this uh, vaccination tumor rate challenge study where we treat B16 cells with uh, led to 12 in a petri dish and inoculated three, inoculated three million treated cells to the, to the C57 black mice and leave, left them for seven days and before re challenged them with 50,000 naive B16 cells. So we found that with the pre exposure to the led to 12 treated um, uh, cells, these animals had uh, significantly arrested tumor growth after the re-challenge. So <clears throat> with that, uh, I just uh, put a brief summary here. Um, our approach delivers a LAT12 radiation to melanoma by, um, by binding with a specific receptor. And we found this uh, uh, synergistic anti-tumor effect uh, in a combination of LAT12 and immunocheckpoint inhibitors. 
And these animals actually gained a long-term uh, anti-tumor immunity after the therapy. Um, we found that there was no synergistic effect in this RAC1 knockout mice indicating that, that this immunity actually relies on the adaptive immunity. So with, with that, I would like to thank the uh, colleagues here and uh, also at the University of Iowa. And also thanks for, uh, thank you for the um, uh, med medical isotope suppliers. Thank you very much, Wang Shi. You can stop sharing your screen. We'll move yeah. on there uh, to Sangeeta. Fantastic work. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Sangeeta Ray from Johns Hopkins University. And today I'm going to talk about our work on preclinical evaluation of lead 220 based radio pharmaceutical therapy targeting PSMA. So as we all know, PSMA has proved to be an excellent target for both imaging and therapy of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. <clears throat> PSMA is a zinc dependent enzyme and it is known for its catabolic activity in central nervous system and also in small intestine. PSMA is also known to have high expression in most solid tumor neovasculatures, but not the normal vasculature, and it is a marker of androgen signaling. So in our lab, we have been involved in developing PSMA-targeted imaging and therapeutic agents for the last 15 years or so. So for targeting, we have mainly relied on this glutamate lysine urea-based small molecule inhibitors. And for radiometals, we have shown that a small linker of about 20 angstrom is important for generating high affinity agents. So for PSMA-based radio pharmaceutical therapy, our major goal was to find an optimized compound with reduce of target toxicity while maintaining similar or higher efficacy than the current clinical agent, this PSMA-617. We also wanted to investigate long-term toxicity studies of these compounds uh, so that they can be introduced at the earlier stage as opposed to the uh, advanced stage as salvage therapy. These alpha-emitting radiometals are particularly important because of their short range and also high linear energy transfer radiations. Since actinium 617 agent has some issue with this salivary gland toxicity, we are mainly focused initially with developing lead 212 based agents. So lead 212 is a, uh, is a beta emitter, but it serves as an in vivo generator for this bismuth 212 agent uh, isotope, which has a detectable gamma rays and um, have, has this uh, alpha emission in the decay chain. So they also have these uh, uh, cascades of gamma radiations that can be used for spect imaging for dosimetry calculation. So as opposed to lutetium, which is a beta emitter, these alpha emitters are highly toxic. They deposit of about 100 to 1,000 fold energy and uh, related and causes irreversible DNA damage. So preclinical optimization to reduce off-target toxicity is really more critical for these alpha emitters compared to lutetium. So this is the structure of our first generation compound. Uh, this compound showed a clinic, a very nice tumor to kidney background ratio. So we selected this compound for late 2 one to based therapy. This agent was also evaluated in first in human studies in Dr. Richard Bohm's lab. Since Tripolo was interested to translate our agent, and this compound showed very similar pharmacokinetics as PSMA617 uh, with this salivary gland uptake, we have then performed a detailed structure activity relationship study just to avoid that salivary gland uptake. So these are our second generation compound. Uh, we have systematically changed different chelating agent uh, and also linker and uh, also the targeting moiety. 
And some of these agents were directly compared with PSMA 617 and PSMA I, I and T. So based on this detailed structure activity relationship study, uh, this compound L1 is uh, recently translated clinically. And this agent indeed showed low or no salivary gland uptake. So this is particularly important for alpha-based imaging uh, therapeutic agents uh, because salivary gland is the major uh, dose limiting organ. So based on that structure activity relationship study, we have synthesized these five compounds for lead 2 on tooth based therapy. So this was our uh, previous lead agent. Um, then we have replaced this DOTA with TCMC because TCMC chelating agents are known to have higher stability for lead at low pH. And then we modified uh, this urea with bromobenzyl group to improve tumor uptake and then reduce the, this linker, shorten that linker uh, to improve, uh, to reduce tu uh, kidney uptake. And this was the structure for our lead compound from the lutetium study. So interestingly, all three DCMC chelated agents showed faster renal clearance compared to this dota chelating agent. So for this uh, optimization, uh, preclinical optimization, we use this late 203 radioisotopes and were supplied by Dr. Martin Breckwell's group from NIH. So based on the bar distribution study, we initially selected for lead uh, this uh, L2 compound because of its a very low kidney uptake, around 3% injected dose per gram, although it was associated with low tumor uptake for late 2 on 2 based alpha therapy. And we have performed uh, a dose dependent efficacy study in our PSMA positive flank tumor model. Uh, this was the effective dose and also safe up to 100, uh, up to 90 days. And then we have also performed this, uh, 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 studied this compound in our micrometastatic model. So this was a little bit aggressive model. So cell was injected and day zero, and then activity was injected 24 hour after the cell injection. So lutetium compound did not show any efficacy in this uh, uh, tumor model, and then we have performed a long-term toxicity study for this compound using several doses from starting one microcurie to 100 microcurie. Although the 100 microcurie dose was effective up to 100 days, but it was not found safe. So it showed renal toxicity. And that's why it's very important we uh, perform this uh, long-term toxicity study. And the maximum tolerated dose was 40 microcurie. This was a single administration, and we have performed these uh, studies in immunocompetent CD1 mice. There was no vital organ toxicity or bone marrow toxicity or hematologic toxicity uh, for the compound. So currently, we are optimizing a fractionated dose scheme for this compound and also working with our second generation uh, uh, agents to provide a safe and effective dose for clinical translation. Since our lutetium compo uh, compound did not show any PS, uh, this salivary gland toxicity, we have also developed uh, this actinium agent. So from late study, we understood that fractionated dose schemes are more important to provide a safe and effective dose. So we performed a single administration and also double administration to check therapeutic efficacy of this compound. And these are the different doses we use. We have also performed detailed long-term toxicity up to one full year and found that this uh, 0.5 microcurie uh, two doses are safe and also uh, effective. So currently we are working to translate this agent uh, for uh, actinium-based therapy. Like 
uh, led to one to we found superior efficacy for this actinium agent in our micrometastatic model but not uh, the corresponding uh, lutetium compound so even though we use tenfold higher doses and this was the alpha camera imaging that showed safety feature we didn't see uh, any uptake after uh, this renal cortical uptake after uh, 24 hour post injection so this is uh, this is a very important feature although it has like four uh, this alpha emitting isotopes so in summary we have several lead agents for both lead 212 and actinium 225 based uh, compounds for clinical translation and one of our agent uh, this uh, was translated clin clinically uh, in support with an, uh, AAA Novartis. And this is something Dr. Breakbell appealed many years before, getting the lead in. And our preclinical therapeutic efficacy data, and also from Heidelberg, it really support this PSMA-based alpha therapy for uh, using lead-based isotopes. So I'd like to thank my team, especially Dr. Pomper for his excellent leadership and also mentorship, and also Dr. Sagur's lab for helping with the dosimetry and alpha camera imaging. And these isotopes were provided by uh, Dr. Martin Breakbell's group and also Dr. Kwamen uh, Baidu for preparing this dose. And I'd like to thank DOD Isotope Program for giving me this excellent opportunity to share our work. Uh, these are the financial support. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sangeeta. Very nice work. Uh, if you stop sharing your screen, screen we'll move on to, uh, to Ibrahim Dalpasand from Radiomedics. Good morning. This is Dr. Dalpasand. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all who have connected to uh, Zoom. Um, obviously, uh, nothing is like a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, but I guess uh, this is the era that we are living in, and this is what we can do. So now I'm trying to share my screen. I hope uh, it is successful. Okay, so this is the... Can everybody see my screen? We can, and we just uh, maybe better if you switch to presentation more if you can. Sure, that I can do. All right, so um, the topic of my presentation is um, uh, using uh, LED 212 labeled uh, somatostatin analog uh, in patients with uh, unresectable or metastatic uh, uh, neuroendocrine cancer. Um, uh, this is a clinical trial that. Uh, uh, we started uh, in early 2018 uh, in collaboration uh, uh, with our partner Oranomed uh, uh, and the clinical trial site was at Excel Diagnostics and Nuclear Oncology Center in Houston. So I would like to share uh, the results of this uh, phase one uh, dose escalation trial uh, uh, with you. Uh, this was um, uh, the initial uh, a study that we wanted to look at the uh, safety and biodistribution and preliminary effectiveness of a led to one to dotantate, also known as alpha medics, uh, in adult subjects with somatostatin receptor expressing neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so, um, the primary objective of this study was to uh, evaluate the safety and dose limiting toxicity of ascending doses of uh, alpha medics. Uh, and uh, as a secondary objective, we wanted to look at the uh, pharmacokinetics, dosimetry, uh, and also initial evidence of effectiveness uh, of this agent. So uh, enrollment uh, at the time of preparation of these slides, we had 16. Uh, now we have 23 actually, but uh, I will, at the end of the presentation, I provide you with some of the uh, most recent results uh, uh, in our patients. Uh, in this group of 16 patients, uh, seven men, uh, nine women, median age of 68, uh, ranging from 27 to 75 years old, 
uh, all these patients uh, had biopsy proven unresectable or met metastatic somatostatin receptor neuroendocrine tumor of different primary sites. As you can see, I mean, we are not focusing on GEPnet or uh, pulmonary or uh, other types of the, uh, depending on the primary site of the uh, disease. This is essentially all uh, tumors, all patients who have uh, uh, somatostatin receptor expressing neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, the dose escalation scheme was a typical um, a 3 plus 3 uh, phase 1 design, meaning that uh, three patients were enrolled in the first cohort, and then if we didn't have uh, any toxicity, we would go to the next cohort, enroll three more patients, and add 30% per, uh, to the dose that we, uh, we used to, uh, uh, in the other, in the previous cohort. And just continuing like this, uh, until we, um, we see toxicity or um, we see significant effectiveness uh, that would uh, assure us that we have received to an effective dose. So initially we started with single accelerating dose or SAD, and then um, after several cohorts, we uh, reached to a multi-accelerated dose, meaning that all patients, initially they were receiving three doses every eight weeks, they were getting one injection. And then actually uh, we amended our IND to allow four doses uh, per patient. Uh, the initial dose uh, was uh, estimated based on our preclinical studies as well as dosimetry study that we did with LED203 as a surrogate uh, in human. And um, uh, as mentioned, uh, the, also the cumulative dose was estimated uh, based on these trials. So inclusion criteria, uh, very typical uh, uh, for um, uh, investigational trials. Um, uh, the most important thing was that in this cohort of patients, we excluded patients with prior PRRT because uh, we, were, we wanted to, uh, to see exact uh, effect of the initial uh, dose on the patients and evaluate the dosimetry and as well as toxicity. Uh, but uh, they also needed to have, obviously, histologically proven somatostatin receptor neuroendocrine tumor, as well as a measurable disease by resist criteria, because that was our um, uh, method for evaluation of efficacy. Uh, in terms of exclusion criteria, as we said, we excluded in these cohorts uh, a prior PRRT in the patients. Uh, and also, we wanted them to be off somatostatin long acting for about 28 days, and if they were receiving um, short acting at least one day uh, stopping before the uh, targeted alpha therapy. So here in this table, you see um, uh, the dose, uh, doses that uh, were received by this patient. Uh, so we are talking about the fourth cohort on multi-accelerated dose MAT4. Uh, the first three patients, uh, they received between four and a half to uh, almost six millicurie um, of, uh, uh, per dose with the cumulative doses ranging from um, 19 to approximately 22 millicurie. Then we expanded this cohort and enrolled um, uh, additional three patients that you see in here labeled as MAT404, 05, and 06. And again, the range of single dose as well as cumulative dose are mentioned in this uh, slide. So here, I would like to share with you some of the results um, of, uh, of our study. This is the initial first three patients on MAT4. Um, so they all completed four cycles of um, uh, uh, LED212 uh, alpha medics with the cumulative dose of uh, 19 to 22 millicurie. And at the time of, pre again, preparation of these slides, uh, which was about a month ago, uh, they had at least five months follow-up at the end of the, um, you know, after the fourth cycle. So here is the first patient, 62-year-old uh, gentleman with uh, metastatic small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, he was diagnosed in February of 2017, uh, had a small bowel resection in the same year, started on sandostatin. Uh, on April of 2017, had additional surgeries with uh, resection of the left, hope, uh, left lobe of the liver uh, and some wedge resection of the tumors in the right lobe, and then uh, was enrolled uh, in April of 2019 in Alpha Medics trial. 
as you can see uh, on the left, uh, there are multiple uh, lesions in the liver around with uh, metastatic uh, lesion in the uh, mesentery. So this is a, a, a sequential uh, images, gallium dodotate images on this patient, uh, starting from April of 2019, showing the baseline and after four injections. And as you can see, as of April of 2020, essentially all the lesions all the, uh, in the liver, they have resolved very minimal uptake in the mesenteric uh, uh, lesion uh, remains. And uh, this patient clinically was uh, doing excellent with no evidence of toxicity. So the second patient, a 45 year old man uh, with history of metastatic lung car uh, carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor with uh, multiple bone metastases and liver metastases initially diagnosed, uh, uh, you know, uh, after having some upper respiratory tract infection, he had bronchoscopy and the biopsy was made and uh, uh, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor was diagnosed. Uh, the patient subsequently had um, uh, uh, upper lobectomy of the right lung and uh, lymphadenectomy of the hilum in 2013, then subsequently in 2014, was found to have bone metastases, a biopsy of L3 vertebrae showed high grade neuroendocrine tumor, uh, and then was started on uh, denosumab uh, uh, later on. In 2018, uh, on the, uh, basically by imaging showed uh, multiple uh, liver and skeletal metastases and progression as compared to the prior studies. This patient had significant bone pain when we saw this patient for the first time on three types of narcotic medications, smoking marijuana for um, breakthrough pain, had a hard time even getting on the imaging table. Uh, uh, so he was really in terms of quality of life, uh, was, uh, you know, significantly degraded and um, had a significant uh, uh, problem even conducting uh, normal uh, usual things uh, uh, during the day. So this patient uh, received four cycles it started again in April of 2019, uh, had four injections every eight week it came for uh, one injection. And as you can see, by March of 2020, this patient uh, gallium scan uh, shows complete response to therapy. We don't see any evidence by gallium uh, of active disease in this patient. Uh, his MRI also uh, shows the same thing with uh, objective radiologic response. Uh, there are some minor few millimeter lesions left in the, in the liver, for instance, but we know those are post-therapy changes. And by gallium, there is no evidence of active disease. At this point, patient, when he came, he came to Houston, was looking for a uh, good golf course to play uh, golf. Uh, so he was really, uh, uh, you know, different person and had started uh, working full time also. So this is a bonus scan on the same patient showing a baseline on the left, uh, uh, multiple bone lesions. Of course, bonus scan is not as impressive as the gallium scan because gallium also shows any lesion in the bone marrow. And these are only bones that they have, uh, they have had some bone destruction and showing osteoblastic reaction. Even on bone scan after four cycles, you can see there is significant improvement in bone lesions uh, noted previously. Uh, the third patient uh, was a 71 year old woman uh, diagnosed in 2014 with bronchial carcinoid again. And uh, this was encroaching the aorta and was found to be non-resectable surgically. So the patient uh, was treated prior uh, to uh, coming to us uh, with chemotherapy, sandostatin, and everolimus. Um, and uh, the disease was progressed while in, on, in all, all of these medications. So uh, she was enrolled on trial in April of 2019. And as you can see, almost the entire left lung is involved by the disease, uh, significant uh, uh, involvement in the hilar region and pleural surface uh, uh, of the left lung. Uh, she was actually oxygen dependent and was using uh, portable oxygen uh, when uh, she came uh, to our center. 
So this is uh, again um, showing after four injections, very impressive response to therapy. What we are seeing essentially at the follow up five months after the last injection is some residual uptake, which is consistent with post therapy um, uh, effect. And uh, for our practical purposes, no uh, uh, significant active disease in this patient, no evidence of a new lesion for sure. At this point, patient was walking around uh, having no problem in respira respiration, no, no portable oxygen was needed. So here is the FTG PET, PET CT on this patient. This patient at baseline had positive FTG, suggestive of uh, uh, more active uh, uh, you know, uh, disease. And uh, uh, after four cycles, you can see that uh, the FTG PET CT also in the region of left lung it comes back to normal with no evidence of uh, uh, increased uh, glucose metabolism in the, in the left lung. So here I like just to share with you some of our more recent, uh, uh, our protocol was calling to expand uh, after re reaching to uh, effective dose, which we thought during the MAT4 first patients we reached, as I showed you uh, in these examples, a protocol calls for additional three uh, patients, so this is three plus three. Um, so uh, we enrolled three more patients. Um, uh, they received four cycles, cumulative dose 18.4 uh, to 23.6 millicurie of alpha medics. Uh, and uh, here are some of the examples after the third injection. Uh, I, I do not have uh, any more recent one. The patients are coming back for follow-up. Uh, this is a patient, as you can see, a uh, 40 year old a woman with rectal carcinoid, uh, multifocal bone metastases, large uh, bulky lesions in the liver, as you can see in the inferior aspect of the right lobe uh, of the liver, a uh, huge lesion over there, somatostatin expressing lesion, multiple in the left lobe as well. And then only after three cycles, the bone lesions, they are significantly showing lower uptake. Uh, the bulky lesion has started shrinking. Uh, we are not seeing as many lesions in the liver. And I can tell you, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, when patient came uh, more recently, there is further uh, improvement in the lesions. Uh, uh, so far, we are looking uh, for objective uh, resist by resist criteria, objective radiological response, we, which we think this patient will achieve uh, hopefully at the time that she comes for the uh, follow-up. Uh, the next patient is another 62-year-old man with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. As you can see again at baseline, multiple bulky lesions in the liver uh, involving both lobes of the liver. And um, after three injection, again, impressive response to therapy. The bulky lesion in the left lobe has significantly shrink, uh, shrunken and also uh, the number of lesions seen in the liver has significantly decreased. Uh, this patient now by resist criteria has objective radiologic response. Uh, the next one um, uh, is the FDG of the same patient. And as you can see, uh, none of these lesions that at the baseline they were uh, uh, showing increased glucose metabolism are now seen. Maybe the tiny lesion in the superior aspect of the right lobe still has some activity, but obviously impressive response uh, in this high-grade um, uh, neuroendocrine tumor. And the last patient is a 50-year-old woman with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, this patient at baseline, you can see almost 80% of the liver is involved by, by tumor. And um, uh, after two injections, we see significant improvement and then uh, continuous improvement. This patient also has objective radiological response by resist criteria in the last uh, 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 follow-up that we had with the patient. So here uh, on the same patient, you can see the uh, fused uh, PET images uh, showing uh, extensive liver lesion. And then uh, in the follow-up in May, uh, you can see uh, a very uh, impressive response uh, by this imaging study. So in summary, 
uh, number one, we achieved the dose, um, uh, the dose of 67.6 microcurie per kilogram uh, of LED 212 alpha medics or dotamtate. Uh, uh, this is an effective dose uh, in this patient. And uh, we see effectiveness regardless of the location of the primary tumor. Uh, therapy consists of four cycles uh, that is given every eight weeks to the patients. Uh, in the first three patients uh, in MAT4, we had objective radiologic response, so essentially 100% objective radiologic response. In the second group, we have five of six, adding the, the other three, we have five out of six patients in cohort four, expand, including the expanded cohort. Uh, we have objective radiologic response, or 83%. We are hoping that the uh, six patient also achieves uh, the limit of the resist criteria uh, for the uh, objective radiologic response. Uh, the most uh, important and I think interesting finding is that uh, so far we have not seen any clinically significant hematological, renal, or hepatic toxicity. And uh, to me, this is uh, really amazing. Uh, putting the effectiveness and um, uh, toxicity, I can tell you that uh, with the experience that we have had with beta PRRT, uh, you know, I have treated uh, more than 1,000 patients uh, with uh, lutetium uh, dotatate. Uh, this kind of results are extremely rare, and uh, this is why we think that we are really uh, having a breakthrough in this area. Uh, which will be excellent for all patients who have uh, this uh, devastating disease. So uh, at this point, um, uh, no, uh, we, we haven't seen any progression as we showed uh, in the first three patients. No, uh, if we calculate from the date that they got the first injection, it's about 15 months. Uh, so, uh, and no evidence of any toxicity. So I think uh, uh, we are adding to the data that we have. And of course, now we have amended our uh, IND so we can enroll PRRT refractory patients also, and uh, would be very interesting to see uh, our results in the uh, PRRT refractory group as well. So here I would like to thank uh, uh, our team at Radiomedics uh, and Excel Diagnostics and Nuclear Oncology Center uh, who performed this uh, uh, clinical trial. Uh, our um, partner, Oranomed and Macrocyclic team, as well as a Rapid team um, uh, who helped us with the dosimetry. Uh, and Inclin has been our CRO for this clinical trial. I also would like to acknowledge NIH for, for their grants that they provided us to help uh, pushing this project forward. So uh, we are very excited about this and uh, uh, we, we say among ourselves, Houston, we have a breakthrough. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Delphasan. Very promising work. I uh, see so you stop sharing your screen. So with that, we can move on to our final speaker, Matt O'Hara uh, from Pacific Northwest National Lab. If you want to start sharing your screen, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, the, it was uh, wonderful to hear these really promising uh, preclinical and, cl and clinical results. Um, this is this this talk is a little bit um, circling back to basically the. Uh, um, the, the basic radiochemistry involved in um, preparing uh, these lead 212 generators. And so this will be an update to my uh, last year uh, when we presented some, some earlier results in our development of some different uh, generator uh, technology um, um, approaches. Okay, so um, as as uh, Roy explained uh, during his talk, the uh, preparation of the generator, this, and what I'm calling is this uh, a wet column-based generator, um, is uh, it occurs in, in two steps. First is that you have to isolate the radium from your thorium-228 source, and then once you have uh, obtained that purified radium, then you load it onto a generator column. Um, 
And so, as Roy explained and actually showed uh, their production um, facility there that's traditionally prepared through a series of these very high dose manual uh, radiochemical processes. And um, so there was, uh, there, there's a need to develop um, alternative approaches to, um, to uh, basically facilitate this process remotely. And so we have been working on fluidically automated approaches uh, to prepare, effectively prepare the generator in the same or very similar manner as the uh, uh, manual method. So one of the, the, the first things we did is sort of look at uh, radium isolation method that could all be performed um, in line um, within fluidics, within, um, you know, pumps and valves and, and solenoids and, and whatnot. Um, so that, that required a little bit of a change in the uh, traditional uh, chemistry that uh, Oak Ridge um, has, has worked out. And so we developed this method for the inline um, approach and then basically built a fluidic system to accomplish these tasks. And so on the, on the bottom right, you see that we have now a sort of a working prototype that um, where basically it's, it's built and we're working on the final uh, programming steps to control all of these individual components. Uh, we built this thing quite small. Uh, the hot cell that we are, um, uh, planning to insert this in has a very small entry port. So we built this with only a 10 by 10 inch footprint to fit through that port. Um, as you see, we have a series of uh, diverting um, solenoid valves for the various fluidic pathways. We have slots for, for columns that can be easily inserted and uh, popped out using a manipulator. And here we have a um, a sort of home-built uh, syringe pump to be able to handle the uh, high-dose material and load it uh, downstream into the into the process. Um, so as I mentioned um, on the, the bullet, the, so everything that we're building here is radiolytically robust to survive, um, you know, long-term um, habitat of this of this hot cell. So there's basically nothing that we've built um, has any sort of uh, circuit board or anything that, that can go bad. Uh, it's pretty much all magnetically driven uh, components off the shelf and 3D printed parts. And so this method here, as you see, we have the, the radium elution band and we just, these are elapsed days here. So you see the, the radium grow in and decay away. Um, it's, it's fairly pure radium. Um, and basically, this, uh, this, this radiochemical process uh, takes approximately one hour to obtain the isolated radium. Okay, so in stage two, we need to prepare the actual uh, lead-212 generator column. And this is, this is you know, very simple assembly made out of a, a piece of a Teflon tube. Um, so the, the, the trick to all of this in doing it, um, you know, non-manually is that you have to you have to mix the the radium homogeneously through the, um, the generator column bed and so um, this is this is basically what what makes the, the process challenging uh, but we think we've worked out a, a pretty elegant solution to this um, and so this is this is uh, uh, basically one one side of the of the system showing some of the uh, fluidics that we've assembled to accomplish this task um, of uh, preparing homogeneously mixed uh, beds of, of radium. And so uh, basically the steps is that it, it takes the, um, it, it pre-measures a, 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 a predetermined volume of resin that will ultimately fit into the column. Down below here, you have the catch bed, which is non-radium loaded uh, resin here. Um, and then the, the radium from the stage one that I just described on the prior sc uh, screen is uh, injected in and accessible by the system. So it pulls that radium in and then it, it uniformly contacts it with with, uh, with the resin, and then it picks that radium loaded resin up and shoots it downstream and um, uh, basically the column self packs through a suspension of, of, of resin and, um, and liquid. 
And so this end-to-end -end process, this is starting um, initially at the thorium-228 level to, you know, the generator-packed column is approximately one and a quarter hours. And, um, you know, we're, we're working on shaving that time down a little bit further, but uh, um, that's, that's where we are at currently. And so, as I mentioned, um, basically the, the overall goal here is that we want to make highly reproducible generators. Um, and we want to do so with reduced uh, dose to the you know, staff that, that you know, has, to, has to produce these for, for the customers. We want to reduce the, the production time and ultimately um, hope that this will have impacts on production cost. And so in FY21, we are anticipating um, basically full-scale uh, generator um, radioactivity levels for testing and then to take those resulting uh, lead uh, prepared generators and do some milking performance studies in-house and then uh, importantly we're, we're very interested um, to ultimately make these test generators available uh, to, to uh, end users for clinicians to be able to, to evaluate their efficacy. And then ultimately, if we get a positive response from these generators or the generators work just fine, uh, we will evaluate how to uh, integrate this technology into uh, routine production. Okay, so uh, the next uh, approach uh, is, uh, that, we're, that we're evaluating is uh, basically producing lead 212 by uh, the emanation of, of radon 220 or thoron um, from the radium 224. So this is basically a one minute half-life uh, radon um, that, that if we're successfully able to sweep radon uh, that's being continuously produced by the radium um, that's loaded onto, onto a source, uh, that we can create this gas phase bridge, in which case um, we have effectively eliminating uh, any possibility for uh, radium breakthrough on the column and also uh, leach out of metals for the column, through the column and, uh, and, and whatnot. So uh, we're really excited about this approach and we're getting some, some really promising results, um, uh, especially from the aspect that um, that we're, um, we're developing the system so that we can have the lead 212 um, product that comes out of the back end of this to be in a, um, in a acetate buffer solution. So just uh, very high level, this is just a conceptual diagram. Basically you have, you have a carrier gas passing through what we're calling the radon emanation source. And so the key here is that you have that you have your uh, radium-224 deposited onto some structure and the carrier gas passes it through and then you catch the, the radon and then vent, um, vent the carrier gas out. And this allows for the lead-212 that is produced from the captured radon here to begin growing in. Um, and this, this ingrowth process, assuming that you're able to capture all of the, the radon in, in the collection zone, um, basically, you, you end up with, you know, in a 24-hour milking cycle, about 85% um, of the, the radium that's there. So, so this is no, no different than the wet column-based um, method in terms of, of lead-212 production rate. Um, so once you have allowed your lead-212 to build up in your, in your radon collection zone, then basically the phase, phase two is the lead uh, stripping stage. So we switch over to fluidics at this point, and then we milk that, uh, that lead off and collect it as a purified product. So I like to think of kind of baseball in here. So this is the radon pitch. Basically, um, this is the going back to the, the radon emanation source. Okay, so, so the two critical aspects of your emanation source is that you, you have to have, um, you have to have a, a, a surface or a material that allows for uh, effective uh, radium 224 deposition. So it has to be able to hold radium and it has to be able to release the radon um, that is uh, generated on a continuous basis. And as I mentioned, we can use carrier gas 
flowing through, say, a porous material to be able to transport that radon away. Um, however, radon is fairly reactive. It has a, it has a, uh, the, the heavy noble gases have incre ever increasing uh, polarizabilities. Um, and so release of radon from just any surface really doesn't, uh, really doesn't happen. And so, um, you know, it's taken quite, quite an effort to identify a class of, of media that, that allows this to happen. And in this data plot here, you can see, so in one uh, radium loaded source, um, we ran through various, uh, various conditions on this material and we could basically switch emanation um, rates on and off effectively. Here's condition one, um, go through various conditions where the emanation drops off very poorly um, and then return back to condition one uh, at the end after, after um, over uh, 20 days of cycling. Uh, basically, there was no performance loss in this test material. Okay, and so on the other end, so that was, that was releasing uh, radon from the source, but now as you send that radon uh, down the line, you have to be able to catch it. And so, um, so again, we're using this, obviously the same carrier gas that is used to release uh, the radon um, has to be amenable to capture in your, um, in your, uh, your source. And so, so we've been, um, investigated cryo-based deposition material, capturing it in line, um, uh, basically through condensation or a deposition process. Um, but we, we found a greater level of sim simplicity with looking at nanoporous media. Um, and importantly, because um, the, when I say simplicity, I mean because you don't, you don't have to have a liquid nitrogen uh, delivery process. Um, so we can do this at room temperature. Uh, which is very important and, and, and again, very simple. And so, so we capture that uh, radon from the carrier stream at room temperature. Um, and then ultimately after your, say your 24 hour buildup of the, of the lead 212 on there, we can dissolve that uh, nanoporous material and um, isolate the lead 212 from the dissolved uh, material component basically. So, so we hold the, the lead up, we wash off the, um, the dissolved um, material components, and then we can elute that lead, uh, like I mentioned, in a label-ready buffer solution. And so um, Meng Shi actually you know, published a really elegant paper, on a cassette-based method, um, where they use acetate uh, buffer. And so we, we took that idea and, uh, and ran with it. And certainly it works in our, uh, in our situation. Um, in terms of holding up the, the lead, flushing the, 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 this uh, dissolved material through, and then eluding it in the acetate. So at this point, the overall process between the, the pitch and the catch um, processes, you know, we're, we're basically at about 85% uh, yields, uh, which is pretty good. And I, I, I honestly don't think that you can get beyond that uh, yield with the wet-based um, material. Um, or wet-based uh, column generator. I'm not exactly sure what that typically runs. Um, but uh, so anyway, um, at this point, that's all I have. And uh, I look forward to answering questions uh, after uh, or at the appropriate time. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, We'll now move into the uh, the Q and A session. We have we have several uh, questions on the on the message board here, and actually, Matt, hopefully you may be able to help out with this first question, which comes from Thomas Quinn. Uh, do you know what happened to the generator source material that Alpha Med had at PNNL? Is that accessible currently for generator production? Well, I I that material did not go anywhere. And that material, as, as far as I know, belongs to the, the isotope program. So it is, I believe, in storage at, at PNNL, but uh, I'm not uh, at a place to, to answer that definitively. Thank you, Matt. So that's probably a question that should be directed to the isotope program. We can, uh, we can do that. Thank you, Matt. Hey, this is Karen Sykes. I can yeah. add on to that a little bit. 
And I can confirm that the material is now part of the DOE isotope program, um, generator program. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for taking me off the hot seat, Karen. Our next question I, uh, is, is, I believe, for, for, for Meng Chi uh, in REG, Kiro Mice, the effect of LED-212 alone and LED-212 labeled VMT-01 is the same. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that this peptide binds not to the tumor cells, but to the immune cells? Oh, I, so I'm, I apologize for the confusion here. Uh, so the LED-212 is actually the abbreviation I used in the figure that represents the LED-212 labeled peptide. Sorry for the inconsistency there. But uh, yeah, we just inject the LAT212 label peptide in all these studies. Thank you, Mengchi. I hope I, I hope that answered the, the question. The next question is uh, from uh, from Serge Leyshenko, and I think this was uh, for Sangita. Uh, once LAT212 uh, is incorporated into a chelate and decays to bismuth 212. Does the bismuth 212 stay in the chelator or gets released out of the chelate and becomes unbound? Yeah, that is that is an issue we uh, we address. I mean, we recognize this issue, but for small molecule, I, I really did not see uh, that problem because its half life is more than uh, blood half life is le just less than one hour, and the, our activity came from NIH, so it was already a couple, you know, at least one half life gone, and um, so that's uh, that most probably for the peptide or uh, maybe antibody based agent, that would be the problem. But small molecule, uh, I don't think it's it's a problem. So I see somebody answered this question uh, in that Q&E section. So they found uh, for the antibody, it's a problem. So I, I showed our data with this uh, uh, long-term toxicity data with the, that dose escalated study. And as you see, Yes, toxicity was there, but uh, you know it was not significant because of the short half-life of the agent. Thank you, Sangeeta. The, uh, the next question is from an anonymous attendee uh, asking, what is the price of a radium lead generator from Oak Ridge or Pacific Northwest National Lab? I myself can't answer that. I would. Uh, direct the question to NIDC, uh, perhaps Karen Sykes, uh, who just spoke before. That's where I would get the, uh, the answer uh, to that from. Sure, I'd be happy to. So that's not information that we give out uh, publicly in these type of venues, but if you're interested in getting a quote, um, you can request one through our website, the NIDC website, www.isotopes.gov. Thank you, Karen. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, does one need a hot cell to operate radium lead generator or will a shielded fume hood suffice? Uh, I think a, a shielded fume hood uh, certainly, certainly would suffice uh, to answer that question. The, the, the radium lead generator from Oak Ridge is shipped in a, in a, in a lead pig, which additionally used in a, in a shielded fume hood uh, which should, should certainly suffice uh, for its use. The next question uh, or comment is from uh, from Robert Acha. Uh, states uh, none of the first three speakers recognize that 30, 30 to forty percent of the bismuth leaves the chelate as uh, as uh, Mercer Dietel showed. In a later study, any 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 RX and I showed that uh, bismuth two twelve does not leave activity associated with organ or tumors, tumor or organs. In blood, we saw bismuth that had left the chelate. This is especially problematic with uh, IgG. With its long lifetime in blood, free bismuth 212 is taken up by kidneys, exaggerating any small molecule expression. Uh, I think that might be uh, in relation to the, the question that was directed at Sangita earlier. Uh, another one from uh, from Robert Acha, the original lead 212 generator by Zucchini and Friedman eluted radon from thorium on an inorganic on an inorganic matrix. We saw excellent yield. The matrix did degrade, which led us to explore the radium parent. 
uh, another question. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Hello, will this will this content slide and audio be made available after the webinar? I think uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Karen again can probably answer that or uh, or shares that. Yes, we anticipate that um, the video will be made available within the next week. Um, I will be sending out an email to all registered attendees that has a link to see that afterwards. Thank you, Shiza. Uh, I think this one is to, uh, to Dr. Delphasand, uh, Radiomedics, why not use lead 203 surrogate to image then treat your disease model? It's like for like swap. It's a like for like swap. Uh, I can answer this question. Uh, basically, I mean, LED-203, uh, availability of LED-203 is somewhat limited. And in our initial uh, study, actually, we, we compared LED-203 with uh, gallium uh, dotatate, and we showed that we can get comparable results. So this is why uh, with that information, we, we moved to gallium dotatate, which is a better imaging agent. Uh, it's a PET agent much higher contrast resolution. And this is why uh, we are using gallium dotatate uh, for uh, you know, enrolling patients as well as follow-up. Uh, LED-203 uh, uh, helped us a lot uh, for dosimetry. Uh, we, we did the dosimetry on six patients with LED-203, uh, but um, uh, because of availability and also better contrast resolution, we moved to gallium dotatate. Thank you, Dr. Lopsan. This, this other one could be towards you as well, and you may have just answered that, but another one from uh, Anthony de Graffen Reed uh, comments this would also get you patient specific dose for your pharmaceutical. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is possible to do actually dosimetry with LED 212, and this is what we have done so far. Um, we did also dosimetry uh, after the uh, injection of therapeutic dose. So. Uh, uh, that is also feasible. It wasn't easy. It was uh, uh, initially uh, development of the uh, methodology, uh, you know, took some time. Uh, but now we have, a, uh, uh, I think we, we have a great way of doing this. And as I mentioned, our colleagues at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, on the direction of Dr. George Segaros uh, has been they have been very helpful in doing those symmetry on led 212 labeled agent. Thank you, Dr. Dobbison. Hopefully that answered the, uh, the question. Uh, we have another one here from Anthony. Uh, Royal Matte materials for the generator are not manufactured in a sterile environment. Are there any concerns or comments related to this aspect? Uh, how they're viewed uh, by a regulatory uh, agency? Uh, I think to, to, to answer that, Question from an Oak Ridge perspective: Yes, the uh, the generators right now are uh, are manufactured in a non-sterile environment in a, one of our radiation labs. Uh, NIDC uh, currently sells the generators as a as a radiochemical uh, generator. So right now it's it's, it's not a concern. Uh, probably as uh, as a uh, lead two twelve work uh, keeps developing, ultimately the radium lead generator would probably uh, have to have a drug master file associated with it. And at that point, I think any of the uh, if the sterile concerns would need to be addressed. Not knowing a lot about DMFs exactly, uh, maybe that does or does not answer that question. And perhaps Matt can uh, can elaborate on that a little bit further. Uh, I definitely don't. I'm no expert on uh, drug master file, but um, uh, I think as as far as as our process is concerned, you know, we're a little bit too early in that process to. Um, to even think about it, we got to get uh, this uh, system testing and make sure the efficacy of the generators uh, is, is fine. Uh, I would also mention on the um, on the radon emanation concept, uh, what what we envision is in, in that particular uh, scenario, having the ability to send a sterilizing gas through the entire uh, system up front. So. Uh, I think that, that 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 may end up being a very simple way to uh, get the um, get the sterility uh, that, that we need. Thank you, Matt. That sounds like a good idea. Uh, there's another question from uh, Anthony for you as well, Matt. Yeah, could you envision a, envision a 3D printed or sleep generator column that could allow you to load the generator resin in a homogeneous manner? Uh, we we uh, definitely are. Uh, sorry. 
there's a delay in my button pushing. Uh, yeah, we, um, we're, we're um, very much interested in, uh, in seeing all the possibilities of, of 3D printing. Um, you know, we are uh, very much actively actually designing uh, uh, generator uh, column assemblies uh, for 3D printing, and we're in the process of acquiring uh, printer that will basically do stereolithography so you can effectively um, print an acrylic based material versus um, the, the ABS uh, method otherwise. So uh, I think it, I think that um, that one thing that needs to be evaluated is the uh, radiolytic um, uh, robustness of the stereolithography based materials um, and also the chemical compatibility with the, the mineral acids that uh, ultimately uh, have to pass through it. So, yes. Thank you, Matt. Uh, before we move on and we, uh, we have you there, I'll ask you one question. Have you ever thought about using a uh, thorium-228 itself uh, instead of radium-224 uh, when, when loaded for the, uh, the radon emanation uh, project? Oh, um, no, actually, we we have not. I mean, ultimately, in for our research um, studies, we definitely are, are um, loading thorium two twenty eight on some of our um, on some of our sources uh, to basically just prolong the um, the uh, time that we can that we can evaluate, particularly when we're we're evaluating these. Uh, nanoporous materials over over you know many iterations and whatnot so it's convenient for us to to have uh, emanation sources that do contain the the thorium 228 um, but you know I, I think that you know Bob Atcher who's who's uh, online here um, certainly back in the 80s basically you know uh, pointed out the the dangers of having um, a very long-lived uh, radionuclide generator in a clinical environment and so, I think that uh, since since um, since Bob uh, Atcher pointed that out, um, I think that's been the the general um, the, the general consensus in the community. Thank you, Matt. And uh, there was there was one more question that I think uh, Dr. Elpsan may have already answered, but the question was: uh, uh, Were the patients with SSTR SSTR positive tumors were they were they with the naive and? Uh, I think you answered that already, uh, Dr. Delbosan, but I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. Uh, that's true. Um, uh, these patients uh, for, for this initial phase were PRRT naive. Uh, but as I mentioned, we, are, we have amended our uh, IND and now uh, actually the last count that I know, uh, we have enrolled uh, two, uh, two patients uh, PRRT refractory. And we're going to enroll uh, probably a total of 10 in this phase, uh, but definitely in the next phase of the clinical trial, uh, we will enroll uh, uh, PRRT refractory patients as well, because we think that's definitely an unmet need in this area. Thank you very much. With that, there, uh, there appears to be no further questions. So I'm inclined to, uh, to go ahead and uh, wrap up this session. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank, uh, thank all of the speakers for presenting today. Uh, thank you for, for all of the attendees uh, for participating in this. Uh, also want to thank uh, Karen Sykes and Sheza Salazar from, uh, from NIDC. I think this call went very smoothly this morning uh, due to their efforts. Uh, so thank you very much. It seems to uh, have gone very well. Uh, and thanks again to the organizers for uh, letting me moderate this session.